right, everybody. We are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for being here. My name's Tucker. I use he, him pronouns. I'm an educator with Wenatchee River Institute here. I'm here with Joshua as well, another one of our community programs educators. Um, thanks again for being here uh, at Wenatchee River Institute. As a nonprofit, our mission is to connect people, communities, and the natural world. Um, and we have kind of two branches of our programs that allow us to do that. We have youth programs and we have community programs. Our youth programs, um, they deliver hands-on curriculum up and down the valley um, and all along the Columbia River with our Traveling Naturalist program. Just today and yesterday, we had um, kindergartners from Prashast and Dryden here on our campus for a field trip, which was super fun. Um, and the youth programs team is really busy this spring doing all sorts of education programs. On our community program side, um, Red Barn events such as this is a big part of what we do. Um, we also have our community garden, various workshops, and a seasonal nature walks. And uh, Leavenworth Spring Bird Fest is coming up in May. We kind of just launched our registration for that, so that's exciting. Um, yeah. So um, just a, a, a quick question. I recognize a lot of faces in here, but is anybody, is this your first time at a Wenatchee River Institute program? Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, as part of our new strategic plan, we're trying to gather some more feedback and trying to gain a little bit more insights on um, people who attend our programs and trying to expand that audience too. Um, you may have seen a little survey pop up on the um, slides going through there, and we can throw it back up at the end. But if you do have any feedback, we're trying to collect some feedback uh, on all of our events. Um, so if you have any things that you'd like to say, you can do that there, or you can come and find Joshua and I uh, at the end of the program. Um, we'd appreciate anything you have to say. Um, so another aspect of our programming here is um, making sure that we're staying connected to the place that we're in and, and the land that we're on. Um, so I'm going to take a moment to read our land acknowledgement. This land acknowledgement was created alongside the Shimpishquashu people. We are spreading the message they wish to be spread to the public. The land Wenatchee River Institute sits on is the ancestral homelands of the Shimpishquashu, or Pascuosa or Wenatchee people. The Shimpishquashu, meaning people in between, had villages positioned along the Wenatchee River and surrounding areas. Their ancestral homeland extends from the Cascade Ridge throughout what is now known as the Wenatchee and Okanagan Valleys. Their, the culture and economy of the Shimpishquashu people centers on taking care of the land. They fish, hunt, gather roots and berries, basket making materials, and medicines. The Shimpishquashu are named within the Yakima Treaty of 1855. Language to establish the Wenatchee Reservation was never followed through, even with the needed surveying completed. Many Shimpishquashu now live on the Colville Reservation, 150 miles northeast of Leavenworth. They were forced off their land here, and the U.S. government moved them to this reservation. The Shimpishquashu people are still alive today. They continue to practice their culture, harvest their traditional foods and medicines, and hold their ceremonies passed down from their ancestors. Most people won't see or notice them, but they continue to be on the land they're connected to. Their traditional language is Inhamchin, an interior Salish dialect, and we'd like to welcome you all by saying hello in their language. Tilhusht. We offer this land acknowledgement as the first step to amplifying indigenous voices and recognizing the harm done to them as a people. We stand as an ally to recognize their connection to the land and their rights to practice their culture on these sacred lands. We encourage all to learn about the indigenous peoples of the place you call home. Wenatchee River Institute is committed to sharing this land acknowledgement and following up with other actions to educate and be respectful. All right, so thanks everybody. Um, one other thing um, that I would like to bring up here as part of our Red Barn events, these events are possible due to our sponsors. So I'm gonna take a moment to acknowledge um, some of our major sponsors. And we kind of um, just redid our sponsorship campaign recently and we got a lot of support from local businesses. So um, any of these businesses that you see here, um, I'm gonna read some of them off. Please support these businesses. That's, um, that's the reason why we can have these events. So um, thanks to our sponsors. Um, in particular, I'd like to thank City of Leavenworth, 
North Central Washington Audubon Society, Sleeping Lady Mountain Resort, Ludwig's German Restaurant, Leavenworth Pine Village KOA, Icicle Brewing Company, Obertal Inn, South Restaurants, München House, Gustav's, Hotel Pension Anna, Leavenworth Chamber of Commerce, Syndicate Smith, Rhine House, Blue Elk Inn, The Nature Conservancy, Wild Birds Unlimited, Leavenworth Coffee Roasters, Leavenworth Village Inn, Sage Mountain Natural Foods, Chocolat, Baron House, Cove, Cove Resort at Fish Lake, Tierra Learning Center, Riverfront Rock Gym, and Rimmer and Reuter Construction. So thank you to our sponsors um, for making these events possible. Um, we couldn't do it without them. So. Um, and thank you all for being here. We couldn't do these events if nobody came to them. So um, thanks again for being here. Um, OK, that's enough for me. I would like to introduce our speakers. Please welcome Luke and Beryl, co-managers of Eastside Rebuild. Uh, we'll take our moment and get our <clears throat> slideshow up here. Everyone doing good tonight? Yeah. Yay. We're going to have a really fun discussion tonight. I'm really thankful that you guys all came. Did you see how pretty Liz was earlier? No. Really nice. Oh my gosh. Like a magical fantasy painting. Oh my gosh, I missed it. Dang. <laughs> Got to look outside more, I guess. <laughs> Alrighty, so thank you, Tucker, for that amazing introduction. Um, as you said, my name's Beryl. This is Luke. We're co managers at Eastside Rebuild, um, which is a project of Waste Loop. Um, and tonight we have a really fun discussion. Uh, we're talking uh, about deconstruction and reuse in that industry. What is deconstruction and how does it contribute to a circular economy and reduces waste? Uh, we'll also be talking about us, Eastside Rebuild, and what our solution to that problem is, as well as you, um, and how the community both fits in as well as how it benefits environmentally and economically. We do want to do a quick shout out um, to Dave Benink uh, with BDI at the Result Consulting, and also he runs the Reuse Innovation Center. He's very multifaceted. Um, he helped to get this project started and also was uh, heavy into the, the development of this presentation. Um, Rick is located in Bellingham, but Dave has been very integral in de developing a nationwide network of reuni reuse innovation centers um, as a consultant and has uh, been helping us since the very beginning of the conception of our project. Um, he's a great example of how this growing industry is a meeting point where construction, deconstruction, uh, creation, retail, and more comes together. OK, so let's start with, oh, we skipped a slide. Let's start with why building materials? Why are we here talking about construction and deconstruction? Well, according to the EPA, 23% of waste that goes into landfills is related to construction and demolition. It's a huge figure. Um, what that turns into in terms of numbers, that's 230 to 600 million tons. Now, to put that into perspective, that's 1,642 1, Empire State Buildings worth of waste that's going into landfills every single year. It's from buildings getting torn down and the excess from construction. Let's zoom in a little bit. In Washington, 18.5% is estimated to be C&D waste. We're doing a little bit better than the national stat. That's good. There might be some reasons to that around um, having more policy around deconstruction or some other um, more green environmental factors that Washington tends to be better at. Um, but we're still talking 975,406 tons, which is about 112 Seattle Space Needles. Whenever we zoom in even further, Chelan County, our main landfill, if you're not familiar, is the Wenatchee, Greater Wenatchee Regional Landfill. Um, it has about 11,530 tons estimated in 2021 by the Department of Ecology that are related to C and D. Um, that's the equivalent of 171 homes in this valley that are getting dumped every year into our landfill. So in terms of 
longevity of this landfill, we're doing better than some. We've got about 78 years remaining until it's full. Um, now, the problem is two years ago in 2022, it was estimated at 90 years. So population increase and who knows what, that fill rate is dropping and dropping and dropping. So little Timmy at home, by the time he's 78, we're going to have some problems. <laughs> All right, one more stat, and then we'll get to the good news. So the EPA guesses that every person gives about 4.9 pounds of trash per day, throws it away. If you extend that to 76 years, average lifespan, that's about 136,000 pounds of trash per day. Now, the average home, say 2,400 square feet, about 56 pounds per square foot. If you do that math, that comes out to 135,000 pounds per home. So what that means, every time a home is demolished, that's an entire lifetime worth of trash that's going into the dump every single time. And in the United States, it's estimated about 685 homes are torn down every day. So what can we do about it? I get to come in with the solution, which is exciting. <laughs> um, so how do we create a loop? We're talking about circular construction and circular deconstruction. So this idea of circular construction is kind of where this loop starts. The goal is to minimize waste while maximizing resource efficiency throughout the entire lifespan of a building. Uh, this is accomplished through all these things you see up here, reuse, eco-building, refurbishment, upcycling, and designing for disassembly. Um, this is taking material and giving them new purpose once it's being done used. Um, this is a sustainable, circular, and regenerative model versus that of a take, make, and consume. How does deconstruction fit into this, though? Because construction is kind of where it starts. What happens when a building gets torn down? Uh, we kind of have to think of like deconstruction versus demolition. Demolition is when you destroy a building or a structure to make way for a new one. But this results in a lot of waste going into the landfill. Right now, unfortunately, demolition is kind of incentivized because of cost and time restraints, lack, lack of awareness, waste disposal practices. Throughout history, we haven't been nearly as concerned about how much space is in our landfills as we obviously are now. And then also governmental policy. How laws are written doesn't really leave room for deconstruction. Um, most demo contracts include hiring out hauling companies to haul away tons and tons of reusable material, which potentially means more money towards the demolition project. Um, but our incentives are changing. Uh, it is becoming more, we are becoming more environmentally aware. Uh, governmental policy is changing to incentivize deconstruction and better building practices. And also, uh, it's becoming more efficient every day to deconstruct. Deconstruction is this idea of taking apart the materials to reuse or recycle instead of throwing them away. And this can be a win-win-win. It's a win for the community. We get more jobs and more affordable building material. It's a win to the contractors, both the builders and the demo contractors, more affordable materials and less hauling fees to the, tra to, to the dump. And then it's also a win for the environment. So less the landfill, less trees being cut down, and less waste material during the development of uh, the materials that we used to build. So the deconstruction is really where this loop is closed. Uh, so looking at an interesting stat, uh, this is a house deconstruction project that our friend Dave actually conducted on one of his houses. Kind of going back to some of the previous stats, um, 135,000 pounds of waste is uh, attributed to a single home being torn down. That is uh, a lifetime worth of waste. And according to Dave and according to uh, the Reuse Innovation Center, about 96% of that can get diverted through reuse and recycling. That's 129,000 pounds diverted. So imagine if we expanded that. Like, what else could we be diverting? Uh, not only residential homes, but also historic buildings. Um, think the Arondo Grange Hall is getting torn down. And what can we do to take that material and reuse it? Commercial and industrial buildings can also be saved and salvaged, as well as just home projects, so bringing it back to you guys. Um, if you're doing flooring removal, maybe instead of throwing that away, donating it. Bathroom and kitchen renovations, deck or patio rebuilds, and even going through your unwanted possessions in your garage or shed, instead of demoing those things, perhaps thinking how we can reuse them. 
Um, and all, the, all different kinds of materials can be reused. Um, obviously, there's the easy, easy ones, furniture and cabinets and appliances. You pick them up and you bring them to Goodwill. But what about doors and windows or lumber? HVAC systems, plumbing can get reused, electrical components and light fixtures, and my favorite, even landscaping. You can pick up a tree and move it somewhere else and not just cut it down. <laughs> so I want uh, everyone to take a moment to discuss with yourself, um, with yourselves, uh, what, think of your last like demo or renovation project that you did. What could have been diverted and could you have disassembled it instead? Go ahead and talk really quick. That was great. Yeah. Hmm? inspiring or anything they heard? He has the whole Home Depot. The under the <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my gosh, yeah. that's a lot. <laughs> Stash there. Anyone else want to share anything? I think one of the biggest struggles when I've done um, some, some remodeling yes. is understanding whether something is salvageable <laughs> or if it's even worth reusing because maybe there's a more efficient in terms of electricity or water usage. It's just better to not reuse it because there's more efficient options. So mm -hmm. I think that like gray area is the biggest struggle I've personally. For sure. That's a really good point to bring up and we'll kind of talk about it later, but we're going to well, there are some places and things that you can do to kind of bridge that gap to be like, is this reusable or not? Because right, sometimes it is just unfortunately worth throwing it away. Um, but that kind of is where we get stopped. We're like, oh, I don't know, is it reusable or not? Awesome, anyone else want to throw anything? Yes. We had a reflection. We had deconstructed an old house on our property. And I think it was made easier because it was old uh, construction. So there wasn't chemical like fiberboards or um, things that are in more modern buildings. So kind of going back to the building for deconstruction and using materials that are uh, real wood. Yes. <laughs> Now they're all like twisted now, they're really hard to get out. Yeah. So it's kind of like, how do you take those apart so you can reuse the one? Right. Yeah. Keep them with a torch. Okay. Keep them with a torch first. That's what I heard. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Those are really great points. And actually is a great segue into our next point, uh, which is how do we build um, for deconstruction, essentially? So. Uh, in the construction of buildings, we can think of things like prefabrication, so building chunks of uh, structures off-site and then bringing them on-site, modular construction, and then designing for disassembly. Kind of think of like adult Lincoln logs. Uh, so in these processes, we're reducing waste, we're improving air quality, so like less construction on-site means less dust less noise pollution, less transportation, um, time and resource efficiency, as well as adaptability and reusability. So adult Lincoln logs, they snap together, they snap apart, and then they can be moved and snap together again. So it really um, is a way to, to reuse the materials and thinking about it in the design process instead of like, taking it apart and being like, oh, what do we do with all of this extra waste that we have to now deal with, the nails and the pallet wood? Um, also, advances in technology and digital modeling tools can facilitate deconstruction and reuse processes. And then think about how you at home might be uh, building. How can you build with this assembly in mind? So like this says, limit, limiting glues, spray foam insulation and fasteners, things that can't really be reused again. And also this idea of maybe post-fabrication. So if you reuse a wall and 
and use it as a wall again, you're essentially reusing all of the components instead of having to take it all apart and then build a wall after that. Um, so all of those things are kind of things to keep in mind when you're doing your next building project. Okay, so when talking about deconstruction, there's five key benefit areas that we've identified. Um, we're gonna kind of get into them each, but to list them off, environmental and climate impact, affordable materials and housing, job creation, some might say green collar jobs, um, equity and education and historic preservation. So environment and climate impact, this one might be fairly obvious to some, um, but a little bit of numbers to put some understanding around it. Um, in a study done with the Reuse Innovation Center in collaboration with the Department of Ecology, um, is found that in the production of lumber from its inception, logging, milling, and all the way to when it lands on the Home Depot shelf, there was found to be about 11 to 13 times more energy required in new lumber versus reclaimed lumber. Three to five percent, or three to five times more greenhouse gases were emitted and trees were cut down. When compared to reclaimed lumber, all of those things reversed, 11 to 13 times less energy required, three to five less greenhouse gas emissions, and you're not cutting down any new trees. Now, forestry's had a large impact on the state we live in, right? Washington has a lot of clear cuts all over the place. Um, it's an important industry in the world we live in, but also whenever we're talking about new lumber versus reclaimed lumber, there's a lot of it out there. And a lot of the buildings in this state have been built with old growth lumber. Old growth lumber's lifespan is very, 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 very long. Um, and so cutting it in half, trashing it is, is almost an insult to a tree that's been alive for a really, really long time, right? So, Especially lumber, there's different reuses for all kinds of different things, but when you're framing out a house, you don't see that lumber down the line, right? It's inside the walls. Most lumber that we're using is not even visible. And on top of that, you can refinish it. You can make it look new, make it look used, rustic, right? There's some demand for that in the world we live in. Okay, second key benefit, affordable housing. That's big here in Leavenworth, right? So does anyone know how much it costs to build a house on average in Washington? Has anyone built a house? $800,000, About $150,000 to build an average home in Washington state. Um, about half of that is the cost of materials. So let's say $75,000 worth of materials at Eastside Rebuild, we're generally selling materials at about a third the price of new. So that's cutting that 75 down to $25,000. That's saving $50,000 on average for a new house. That doesn't change labor or anything else, but that's a huge cost savings. Um, now, to talk about some more specifics, to tell a story, this, this picture on the left-hand side, it's a cabin up in Bellingham that was built by trees that grew on the property that it was built. So those trees were cut down and milled down on site and turned into this house. I believe that house was then deconstructed and then reconstructed to create this house that you see in this picture here. All of that cedar siding has been used now twice and it looks beautiful, right? That refinishing and up cycling is huge and really can lead to some rustic vibes. Um, now, value-added products, this is talking about whenever something is just maybe too trashed to reuse in its original fashion. So kind of get on, on what you were talking about. Um, whenever you take something, and we're all familiar with the term upcycling, right? So it's using something for maybe something that it wasn't originally intended for. So these planters right here, I believe, came as siding from a house, and they were cut too short. They were they were trashed a little bit and they were put onto these planters so that they could be used as planters. So then the last thing, Beryl mentioned post fabrication a little bit, but the biggest energy savings that we can get and the cheapest materials we can get is whenever you quite literally just pick it up and put it somewhere else. It saves all of the costs of taking it down, putting it back up, 
everything. So there's a lot of ways in which this creates affordable materials and affordable housing. Awesome. So the next key benefit that we get is job creations. Luke mentioned like green collar jobs, which is essentially um, this idea of jobs that are focused in the environmental sector. Um, so this is a case study done by the Building Construct Deconstruction Institute, where we learned that about 20 times more, 20 times more green jobs are created through deconstruction versus demolition. So uh, kind of breaking it down, this was a study that was done with three homes that were being deconstructed. Think like five people to deconstruct the home, one person to drive the truck, and then three people remanufacturing the products that came from the homes, and then also five people selling at the store. Um, so we have deconstruction workers, we have transportation workers, we have remanufacturers, and we have retail workers. Um, that came out to be about 2,040 hours of work. Now it takes about 100 hours to demolish all of those buildings. So 100 times 20 makes it about 20, 2,000, or 2,000 hours of work. Um, now, perhaps that sounds like, oh, that's a lot of uh, working workers, uh, like hours being paid to have people work. But perhaps it takes one or two demo contractors getting paid $40,000 and bringing in large bulldozers and excavators. They have to pay those companies. They have to pay the haulers to get rid of the waste. Um, but what kind of societal and environmental costs does that carry? Now, think of 20 local workers working diligently on constructing or deconstructing, remanufacturing, and then selling materials. That's the same pay, but more money into local individuals' pockets as well as back into the community. So due to the approachability of this work, we can oftentimes offer skill development to youth, members of Tierra Village, newcomers into the industry, as well as uh, the broader local community. And lastly, this also contributes to a boost in economy. Uh, by deconstructing, you are creating more reusable materials uh, that can be sold as raw materials or, like Luke said earlier, these value-added products. And ideally, these products would stay local um, and help everyone in the community in the process. So in conclusion, it, 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 it does take longer, but it is saving on environmental and societal costs, plus it's staying in the community and bolstering our economy. So next, we have our community-driven aspect of um, the benefits of deconstructing. Uh, reuse brings people together. It encouraged creativity and community action. And at Eastside Rebuild alone, we've already uh, gauged about or logged about uh, 250 hours of community support. Uh, this industry makes building, renovating, and uh, repairing more affordable to groups of people who otherwise might not be able to pay for the rising cost of building materials. And this starts with you. So I want you to turn to your neighbor and discuss, oh, it all popped up again. What skills, donations, or knowledge can you bring to the table? And how would services like this help you? Go. <laughs> what they said or heard. Yeah, 
For sure, just knowing where to bring it. And maybe we can help to determine what is and isn't usable at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Kendall Spot volunteering at the tool, at the, uh, the tool library. Oh. So, uh, you know. She's going to be the one to be handing those out and uh, making sure they go, go out correctly and come back. <laughs> yeah, and the yeah. fun thing about that is that I learn more and more about tools and all the different right. things that are there because I'm touching them. I'm like, what is this? And then I look it up and then I'm learning along the way, which is kind of exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. Anyone else? Cool. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Awesome. So this is the exciting part. Enter Eastside Rebuild. So this is our mission statement. We provide economically and environmentally sustainable building materials, along with the tools and knowledge needed to empower all communities of the Wenatchee Valley to rebuild and repair the world around them. So there's kind of three co components that you see in there, building materials, tools, and knowledge. And we'll kind of break down how Eastside Rebuild provides all of those a little later. Uh, but I also want to highlight that we say empower all communities. Uh, we really want to bring attention to the, uh, the fact that we are a safe space and uh, we want to make accessibility for everyone, especially in an industry that oftentimes underrepresents minorities. So kind of... The development of Eastside Rebuild, um, back in 2023, Waste Loop uh, put out a community engagement survey, and they found out of 130 respondents that about 99% uh, of them were interested in a local creative reuse center. So this launched the inception of the Department of Commerce Industrial Symbiosis Grant. There's something on the bottom of my foot. <laughs> I didn't like that. Uh, so the goal of this grant originally was to divert waste uh, from landfills and promote a circular economy by encouraging the repurposing or refurbishment of items that would otherwise be discarded by the local construction industry. And with the generous grant from the Department of Commerce, Eastside Rebuild was born. Woo! Yay! So to discuss kind of the, the network that we're working within, this is a map uh, with circles around the service areas at different reuse centers around the state. So we fall in right here. So there's a really large area that we're hoping to serve. All of North Central Washington, we're in a bit of a desert when, it's, when thinking about what resources around us for reuse and tool rental, affordable tool rental. Um, so it's projected that our, our reach is going to be most of central Washington and potentially into eastern Washington. There's, there's not much out in eastern Washington. So Beryl mentioned those three parts of our mission statement. Um, the East Side Rebuild has three major components. The building materials store, the tool library, and the workshops and repair cafes. We're going to dive into each of those. They're all very important in creating this system where everyone can have access to building. And they're all very important because each person kind of falls under a different scope. Homeowners, one scope. Builders are going to benefit from some of these things. And then renters as well. Young people are benefiting a lot from things like the tool library and the workshops. So to discuss the building materials store, um, it's not open yet, but we are accepting donations on a daily basis. Um, we're working on building partnerships with the community, with builders, um, with construction companies and manufacturers all up and down the valley, including retailers and you name it, really. There's a lot of people, even in this room, that have brought us materials already and donations, and for that we thank you. Um, we hope to open the store April 27th. It's about a month away. We're very excited. We're there working pretty much every day, so if you ever want to see it, um, you're welcome to come take a look. One thing that we're lucky to be able to do is in the reuse industry, we're not dealing with you know, wholesalers that are trying to sell us something and then we try to sell it to someone else. We get to bring in what we want. And so one thing we get to do is kind of create the supply for what demand exists. So all of you, if you know how to use a QR code, go ahead and take your phones out, scan this code, and it's going to have you fill out a quick little survey there's a few different items on it, and it's just talking about what you might want to see in the building materials store. Yeah, that's 
that's your cue to get your phone out. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> is it working? Is it working for everyone? Okay, great. <laughs> it's not working. You're going to fill out what you want, though. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure it works. Give me a thumbs up if you finish. You don't have to. You have to do it. <laughs> you can also sign up for a Alrighty, so moving on to our second component, who has heard of a tool library before? Awesome. You guys are much smarter than I was about a year ago. I had no idea what that was. was. Um, but we obviously, it's something, it's a concept that a lot of people are familiar with, and it's a concept that the rest of the United States has obviously caught up with. Um, according to this map, there's a lot on the west side, there's a couple that are sparse up and down, and there's one in Spokane, but kind of like we have a desert of building reuse material stores, we also live in a desert of tool libraries. And so the concept of a tool library is essentially you pay a small membership fee, you can come rent out our tools, you can have them for a week at a time, and then you come and don't, uh, give them back. Uh, has anyone rented from Home Depot before? couple times. So according to their website, it's about $25 per day on average for like a power tool, like a drill and a circular saw. Um, so two tools equals about $50 a day versus at the tool library, we're hoping to on average take uh, have a $50 membership fee for the entire year. And this will allow unlimited amount of tool rentals um, and our inventory is still young and growing, but we're hoping with the sliding scale approach of being able to uh, pay what you can afford um, or pay more than maybe we had originally asked that we can uh, bolster our tool inventory as well as provide scholarship for those who can't afford our membership. Um, this, is making it, this is where accessibility comes in and trying to give um, as much to the community as we possibly can. So essentially, uh, at the end, we'll have another QR code where you can sign up via MyTurn, which is the program that we're using. You can browse our inventory online, create reservations, and then you have your tool for an entire week instead of just a day um, where you can get as much as your project done as you can. Um, we also are lucky enough to have Lizzie over there in the back who will help us with membership uh, signups and paying at the end. So if you guys are interested, you can do it right now. And fortunately for you, our tool library is open. 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, every Saturday, and hopefully those hours will just increase um, as we open more and more of the shop. Moving on, this is the education portion. Um, Real, oh, that's too many. <laughs> Look, a celebrity, okay. Um, so our repair cafes. Uh, we had our first repair cafe of 2024. We actually had two. But on our first one alone, we fixed 41 items. 26 community members were served, and 105 pounds of waste was diverted, which is really cool. So essentially, a repair cafe is the community coming together and volunteering. We bring a bunch of community experts, repair experts, to come and fix household clothing items, such as clothing, electronics, um, appliances, and this is trying to promote sustainability and reducing waste. So instead of throwing your clothes with holes in them away, you can bring them and we have like 10 sewing machines set up for you to get something fixed. So our first in-house one at Eastside Rebuild is going to be May 1st at 6 p.m. Um, and we'll talk about how you can get involved as well as what kind of things you can bring to that event. Um, and then finally, in our education sector, we have workshops. So we are lucky enough to be in partnership with NCW Woodshop. Mr. John Clark's actually in the back, you want to give a wave? If you have any questions about NCW Woodshop, they're a fantastic partner that we've had. Um, we are going to be hosting another two power tools for women and gender expansive people on April 7th, as well as May 5th. 
from two to five. And in this three hour course, I'll actually be your instructor and uh, you'll get to learn um, about power tools um, in a non-judgmental environment, especially like we said before, this is a very under or underrepresented industry and we wanna really build and bring people in who don't oftentimes get to be in that world or feel really uncomfortable in that world. Um, we're also offering uh, an open-ended scholarship uh, through the support of the PPG grant. Um, so all of that will be on the sign-up page once, which we'll have also a QR code at the end for. I know, lots of QR codes to overwhelm you guys. Um, and also, no, NCW Woodshop has a lot of really incredible workshops that you guys can sign up for as well. Um, and so you can either look them up or through, when you sign up for the Power Tools course, you can go and see what else that they're offering there. Um, so if you wanna get involved, we talked about volunteering a lot. Uh, we have a lot of ways for you guys to do that. One of those is through the repair cafes if you wanted to come bring your skills and um, like Tiffany did that one time, repairing for us at the uh, with her, her sewing machine. We also have volunteer help days. So uh, these are days we're going to be um, cleaning up and doing a lot of things on site, uh, we have a lot of building to do, cleaning up to do, we have repairing to do, um, and we have a lot to prepare for before our opening, like we said, on April 27th, as well as our first repair cafe. We need to get the upstairs up and ready. And then finally, you can become a tool librarian, like Kendall. Um, we're open, like I said, every Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Through this QR code, you can also send, sign up for um, shifts there. Okay, so next up, um, we have a guest speaker today with us. Larry Lamont um, has another business in the Valley that is doing some incredible things for reuse. So we'll invite Larry up here for a moment to talk about his business. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Hi. I'm the guy with the Home Home Depot. <laughs> uh, I got three words for you. Um, let me see if I get them right here. Um, multiple gigaton impact. Kind of sounds like an action movie, doesn't it? Multiple gigaton impact. <laughs> well, it's not. It's, it's kind of the world that I fly in with my company and capture it. When, uh, when uh, Luke and Beryl put on the screen there the 230 to 600 million tons of waste every year, construction and demolition waste, that is 230 to 600 gigatons of waste. That's a lot. That's a million times 2,000. That's, that's massive. Um, so I saw those three words together in an email to me today. He's, a fellow was uh, <clears throat> talking to me about what we do and what he does, and uh, he said in that trio that multiple gigaton impact. So that's the scale of the work he wanted to do. I thought, hmm, now we're talking. That's, that's kind of the realm we're working in. So um, my background's in architecture. I went into uh, construction. I went into, from that I went into remodeling because I wanted to learn how to do every part of it from the foundation on up. I've torn apart buildings and, and I, and for years, I always wondered, are you, why are you throwing that away? What are you doing with that? Hey, can I put that in my trunk? Can I, can I throw that in my truck? You, you good with that? And I was squirreling stuff away all the time. And back in the 1990s, I, I, I've been crazy a number of times, but this is probably the craziest time. I took a little 800 square foot house, jacked it up 11 feet into the air, made a new house out of it, put a foundation under it, uh, gutted the inside. But as I was gutting, you know, there's this old, old wood ship lap and and all that stuff, and I'm cutting it up and putting it in little stacks and pieces, and I'm saving stuff, and I incorporated things into the house that I then built. And like I told a couple of you, there are beams in there that were, I left exposed, like these are exposed. But people look up there and like, are those hammer marks? Uh, yes, they are. Well, <laughs> did you miss? <laughs> I'm like, no, I didn't miss. That's, uh, I took them out of this and I put them in up here, and, and uh, so fast forward from the 90s to just about uh, seven years ago, I decided to do kind of a career reinvention. And I wanted to do something different, something impactful, something kind of of the heart. And I'd done, and this would be my seventh startup now. So again, like I said, it's kind of crazy. Um, but this, <laughs> this one had to embody the, uh, 
the building, the, uh, the construction, the architecture, and the uh, various types of businesses I've built in e-commerce and other things. And that brought me to looking at all of America and all of the world, in fact, in what I call a satellite view, and seeing, you know, what's going on with building materials? And, and I talked to people at the EPA, and they told me those statistics that uh, Luke and Farrell put out there, you know, and I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, do you all know what municipal waste is? Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's the stuff you and I and 330 million Americans throw away all day long, every day, homework. And municipal waste is a lot. We're the, probably the biggest in the, in the world in that category. So I talked to the EPA, and they told me, well, you know, where do you think construction and demolition fits in that? And I go, oh, my gosh, that, that's got to be huge. That's got to be like, you know, what, 30 40%? more. They're like, it's a separate category. I said, okay. So how big is it? They go, it's two times bigger than municipal waste. So everything, all we throw away is not all we throw away. We're throwing away whole buildings all day, every day, 365 days a year, all across America. And all the efforts that have gone into the process of diverting these materials from the dump into new uses, into new construction, and so forth, recycling or reuse, is only roughly about a sixth or a seventh of the potential. Let that sink in. So that means five, six, seven times more than the entire ecosystem of reuse and, and recycling of building materials is still trundling off to the dump. That's the world that I'm playing in. And we looked at that existing model of the ecosystem, and we, it, it is what it is, and it's doing tremendous things, but it's not accessing the demand side and being a business guy. I look at supply and demand all the time. We built a marketplace. Recaptured.com is an online marketplace, sellers and buyers. So I got to look at that teeter-totter of sellers and buyers. The buyers that are not activated yet and the ones that we're going after are collectively known as the architecture, engineering, and construction industry, also known as AEC. The architecture, architecture, engineering, and construction industry are not reaching their hand down happily and extending a loving hand to us in reuse to say, hey, listen, we'll do whatever you need to you know, help you out and make it work for you. They're not doing that. They have extraordinarily expensive systems and so forth that they have in place that they use, they're not going to reach down to us. The, what I affectionately call, the masking tape, masking tape and Sharpie inventory system is not what architects use. They're not going to go to a, a, a reuse center and you know go flipping through um, a deck of cards of doors to find that for a project. They're just not going to do it. So we're going up to them. We're, we are advocating and we're working with, with cities across America now um, to advocate for policy, for reuse, deconstruction, and uh, diversion of these materials away from the dump into new uses and um, much greater volumes than the current capacity of the existing system in a new system that uh, stores a lot more stuff in giant warehouses, processes a lot more, puts it into the systems, the electronic um, systems of inventory and so forth, so that architects can specify, use this used stuff, and builders will buy it. Oh, we gotta buy the used stuff. And building owners and uh, developers will pay for it, going like, oh, we can get that stuff now? Will that be good for us? Will that, will that look good on the balance sheet? It's cheaper. <clears throat> We can also legitimately fly the green flag. Mm. Oh, so we're we're working to speak their language. We're working to maintain and to uh, even augment potentially profitability, so that they actually incorporate those materials. Because if they don't, at some point, somebody's going to have to put the brakes on the whole system and say, "This is going to have to happen universally across the country," and that could be kind of difficult to absorb systemically. So we're working from the ground up, city by city, advocating, educating, and uh, helping them to implement policy. So along with selling the stuff
from the seller side on recapture to the buyer side on recapturing uh, for all sorts of architectural salvage, used materials, and uh, and that's us. So I think my time's probably over. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Larry. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Thank you. Okay, y'all, we are starting to wrap up. There's a couple slides left. Um, we want to give a quick shout out to the people who've helped us thus far. There's a lot. Um, some of the major ones, the Side Street Cashmere has given us a lot of space to operate in. We're th very thankful. Um, the Department of Commerce has given us a generous grant that we've been used to get this all kick-started. Um, the Building Deconstruction Institute has helped us a lot. Our partnership with NCW Woodshop and many generous volunteers and donors. Thank you. Um, last thoughts. This is a community-driven project. Um, everyone in this valley can and might play a role. So I'm asking you, what can you bring to the table? Are you a builder? Are you a homeowner who might be doing a remodel? Are you a renter who might need some tools? There's a lot of ways to get involved. So think to yourselves. How can you get involved? Um, reach out to us if you have any questions or want to donate anything. Um, we are on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we have a website, and reuse at wasteloop.org will come direct to me and Beryl. Thank you all so much for being here. That's our talk. Have a good night. <laughs>
want to figure out if you have enough of what they're looking for, or is there, have you thought about like how that would happen yet? Or like, could they like claim a certain, I don't know, like, I, I'm sorry, do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, so I, like, yeah, like what I'm you? hearing is like, if a contractor comes to us, how do they like secure the yeah, materials from yeah, exactly. us? Um, do you have anything? I, my main thought is like, we're obviously starting really small. Like we are trying to, uh, we're really helping the local consumer get materials that they need. But in terms of contractors, we're hoping to partnership with contractors, both uh, building contractors and demolition contractors to get more, um, to see like what more of their needs are and how we can fulfill them. Um, ideally like tool libraries, they'd be able to rent out uh, that the tools that they need for those, but you need really specialized tools sometimes that we might not have yet. So all of that's going to come kind of with the growing pains of starting this business. Um, but that is something we definitely have in mind is how can we partner with these contractors and get them the materials they need um, to build with more conscious building practices. I guess to add on to that, um, right now in the early stages builders and contractors are prim primarily the suppliers of materials because they have a ton a ton a ton of stuff yeah. um, it's unlikely at least for a while that we're going to have enough flooring to cover a whole house right so for now we don't have a lot in that realm and our main demographic for who's going to be buying are going to be homeowners um, that are diying projects or things like that um, but we definitely hope, and the more we get into deconstruction, the more we can have large quantities of materials on hand for, for jobs. Um, there are, there's architects and builders in the valley that are very interested in building with secondhand materials, um, and that being a part of what they do, and that being their draw for certain clients. Yeah. Kind of piggybacking on that question, um, it's, it, it, you know, it's, always difficult to find the right team when you're, especially with new builds, the right contractors, the right architects. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have, if somebody were to come and say, here's my project, I'm ready, I've got the budget, I've got the dirt, whatever, I want somebody, I want my team put together with a very enthusiastic approach to sustainable, you know, building. Um, do you guys have a resource where you could, can you guys help me put that team together? We don't yet. Um, so we are just kind of focusing on those three areas for now, getting those up and running. But that is definitely on our list of, of what we hope and dream is, you know, having this list of, of green contractors, green architects, and being able to refer people. That's a part of the original Reuse Innovation Center dream is a bunch of businesses working together in um, conjunction with each other. And so uh, being able to do that for people would be a dream for sure. Yeah, and like coming out of the woodworks, no puns intended, <laughs> uh, with our with our with this whole project coming up, there are contractors approaching us who are like, oh, I'm really interested in that, and I think that would be a great place to start to like make that list. We already have people who we know and trust, and like we could already point you that way, and then hopefully that'll just build and grow as we become bigger. Question? Another idea is to contact the thrift stores in the area because we get so many donations at the thrift store here in Leavenworth. We don't have space for a lot of it. And yeah. so we're always saying, I'm sorry, we can't take that. I'm sorry, we can't take this. But if we had your little cards or something that said, but I know a place that could, mm -hmm. we could pass that out to them. Yeah, that would be really amazing and a great idea. Because I'm sure a lot of places don't have the room for building materials. So. <laughs> So uh, I talked to Dave Benning for about an hour last week. Uh, he's, a, he's a friend of mine. And he uh, wanted me to make sure to tell you that use him, use him, and abuse him, and use him. So I, I delivered the message. So, um, but one thing within the uh, Reuse Innovation Center that is core to it, and you just touched on it, Luke, but I, I, if I may expand on that, sure. is that, um, Luke, you said that there were, a, um, that there are uh, small businesses as part of this. It might be an architect, it might be a, a builder and whatnot. It, back to that supply and demand side thing, what I've seen in other cities that has worked marvelously well is outreach to the demand side particularly. Because if you get demand, the supply will find its way um, in this model. 
So craftspeople, furniture makers, <clears throat> um, Finnish carpenters, cabinet makers, uh, anybody who would use those things. The, the, uh, the sculpture that's outside here, the, the bird and the nest and oh, so yeah. forth, the metal, mm -hmm. you know, scrap metal is huge. I mean, it can go get trundled off, crunched up, melted to make it into the same thing it already was, which baffles me. But, uh, or, you know, somebody can take it and make marvelous things out of it. They make furniture. There's a, there's a, uh, a company in Seattle whose name escapes me at the moment, but they use the steel. They use wood from old ships. And so just find people that are using that. And I'm saying this to you in the audience, too, so you think about that, too. If you think of people that are doing interesting things with materials, they might be good recipients of the materials that you have in there. So just a prompting of our brains for yeah. that, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. that's amazing. I like I love that thought process. <laughs> um, for the deconstruction crew, are you going to plan on having like classes to teach people to learn how to do this, or like some of the places that are already having classes to teach them, or how does that work? We would bring in uh, the Building Deconstruction Institute okay. is an educational organization that teaches people how to deconstruct. Cool. Um, and so we would bring them in and do workshops, and those would be paid jobs too. If we're dealing with like risk and all of that, those are those are paid positions on a deconstruction crew. Yeah. And then also, if like a lot of people want a specific type of thing, are you like in connection with the other reuse places to be like, do you have this stuff? Could we get this over here? Yeah. Or sort of like a training thing. Yeah, we are in contact with many of the reuse centers around the state, and um, that sort of transfer of materials when, hey, I'm full, like, do you have space for this? Sure. There's a truck going over, um, is, is a part of the division for sure. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. What do you all feel is like the biggest hurdle that you're currently trying to face into expand or meet demand or grow in these certain ways that people are asking about? I think just time and the fact that there's only two of us. <laughs> we are there working every single day, and the community has shown a huge amount of support. Um, we started working full time in January, so this is all happening really fast. Um, the project got kicked off last August, so a lot's happened in a short amount of time. So there's currently not any large barriers other than there's just two of us in time. So any volunteer help is huge because it, it very directly accelerates the opening of all of this. Yeah. I still don't have to keep you a mural if you want one. Yeah. <laughs> you do. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So if someone has a site where they want to do deconstruction, like a household, some, some, uh, would you all be open to coordinating with, uh, what's his name, Dave? Dave, Dave yeah. Coordinating with him or somebody to do like increase awareness through a community deconstruction project locally? Yeah, definitely. Um, we actually have the go-ahead to, to send people who want to deconstruct their buildings to Dave, and he might come out and do a, a, a look and see about it. He does live in Bellingham, so there's, there's a, a barrier there. But um, he has definitely done deconstruction projects in the Wenatchee Valley and the surrounding areas before. Any other questions? All right. Well, I think we've hit our time. Thank you so much again for being here. Um, we do have some booth information here and tool library sign up. So sign up on your phone, and Liz, you will get you hooked up with the rest. And we're open this Saturday. So if you have any projects you want to get started on, you can do them now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.